Hi, everyone, and welcome to Wine.com Experiences. I'm Gwendolyn Osborne, and this is Couples in Wine. So today we are going to be talking to three couples who work together in the wine industry, uh, producing the quintessential wines of their region. And um, they just are here to share their experience and their stories, which should be some good ones. And I'm uh, very sure this will be a really fun conversation. So we have a trio of wines to taste. And if you've already purchased these wines ahead of time from wine.com, wonderful. This is the time to get those bottles open, start pouring them into some glassware. Uh, if you don't have the wines, you're in luck. The trio is still available on wine.com. And of course, the YouTube uh, or this video will live on on our YouTube channel um, from now on. So the three wines that we are tasting in order are the Love Block, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, the Rocco Gravel Road Pinot Noir, and the Joel Gott Zinfandel. Uh, and we have some incredible guests here to talk about these wines and again, share their stories. So joining us from New Zealand, we have Kim and Erica Crawford with Love Block. Hello and welcome. Hi. Hello, hello. Good morning, right? Good morning. Good morning for you. Good morning. Um, from Willamette Valley, Oregon, we have Rollin and Corby Souls. Hello. Hey. Hi. Hey and then um, joining us from California Wine Country, Joel and Sarah Gott. Hello. Hello. Great. I'm so glad you were all here um, to talk about your wines, your stories, <laughs> um, and, and um, working together, which can be um, a very wonderful thing. And yes, can't wait to hear about it. So um, I think the story, one story that, uh, or one question that came in with some of the guests that are attending was, how did you meet? So uh, Kim and Erica, I'm going to throw that to you to start. How did you meet? Oh, well, it feels like a long time ago, doesn't it, Kim? <laughs> so we met, actually met in South Africa, where Kim was working in his, in his first grad job, um, working at a company called Baxberg. In the, in, the, in the Cape area. And I just started my first real job after, you know, doing research in, in medicine. And it was at a wine festival. And, you know, um, I went with a childhood friend of mine who was the accountant and there was this bloke. And, um, you know, I suppose one thing led to another. Yeah. At the wine festival in South Africa. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he did tell me he was going to marry me on that first day, and I did ask him if he was mad, and he said, we're still here. Yeah. <laughs> Michelle, some of the mad ones are the ones that you should hold on to, I feel. So, um, uh, so Rollin and Corby, what about you? What was your meeting like? We met here in the Willamette Valley. We actually both were moving here at the same time in 1987. Rollin was coming here to start Argyle at that time, and I was moving here from California to start Panther Creek Cellars. Um, we met through a mutual friend, and Rollin helped us move into our first house. Ah. We were um, married to somebody else, so it took probably six years for those things to change and for us to actually get together personally. It's okay. I've, I've heard many of those stories where they meet on like dates with other people. <laughs> I know. It's a but, common thing to marry people you meet as friends, you know, so. It is. Well, yeah. you should marry. What I, like, what I like is that we were such good friends and for a long time. And I, I just love being in a relationship with, you know, basically my best, but really my best friend. It's really neat. I, I agree. That's something that, that lasts for a very long time. So that's important. Um, Joel and uh, Sarah. We well, both lived in Calistoga in the early 90s. And uh, first of all, there's not many young people living in Calistoga. So you find each other <laughs> pretty quick. Especially back then. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you, did and, you guys hang out at the grocery store or something? Wasn't that it? Yeah, mm -hmm. I had a grocery store. Yeah. Sarah was the enologist at Joseph Phelps Winery. Um, yeah. And somehow we had some friends try to connect us. I actually used to buy tomatoes from Sarah's mom. Um, at the grocery store. So I knew the mom way before I knew Sarah, but I did not know Sarah's mom was the tomato lady. And uh, then <laughs> I saw her in Catahoula, which was a bar and uh, actually went home, showered, put on clean clothes and came back to try to make an impression. And it worked 25 years later. Yes. There is nothing like clean clothes to bring a lady in. I will tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> smelling, smelling clean. So 
Um, well, that's wonderful. So now I want to delve into the wines and tasting the wines, and you guys could talk a little bit more about um, creating um, the wineries where you are now. So um, we're going to start with a love block down in New Zealand. Um, and um, Kim and Erica, you have been, you know, working with Sauvignon Blanc in New Zealand for a long time. So can you kind of tell us about that, that path and, and how it ended in, into creating Love Block and the mission behind that? Well, I think we just quickly need to go back for a few seconds to the early years of yes. New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. You know, we took Kim Crawford to the US, what was it, 1997? And I think we were the third company in. And people didn't know where New Zealand was, that it made wine, that it wasn't part of Australia. So it was really pioneering, you know. And then giving people a glass of this was like giving a kid Coca-Cola for the first time. Their faces just lit up with with this discovery of these big flavors. So it was quite amazing, wasn't it, Kim? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so we really started when that whole explosion happened. Mm. Or Sauvignon Blanc, and I mean Kim said something here before that that that's really relevant about the Kim Crawford model, huh? Well, I mean, there's really a production-driven model, so we just pick. Well, at the moment they're starting to harvest in Marlborough. Three weeks before we would be picking our love block because they have to get X amount of wine grapes through the winery every day. It's just a, a production model now. Well, the um, for the bigger companies, yeah, mm. that, that that is quite different because the, the industry has grown so tremendously much. But what it has done is um, enabled us to be able to buy these lovely vineyards and um, take a take a, a hit on profit and farm organically, you know. Um, so and that's really dear to, to and very close to me, particularly. Yeah. Um, so we've just flipped the model. So whereas before we were all grow based. And at the time, you know, it was really quite new. Mm -hmm. So we now we state, which is really quite common in the US. Um, and uh, so that's the biggest change, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the organic, so going, yeah, the organic the change is uh, the, the way the grapes grow as well. So we, we I couldn't make an old the old style with the grapes I'm getting now because it's just a different beast. Uh, so in the old days, we'd have a very vigorous growing plant and completely shaded Sauvignon Blanc. So we get those big green flavours, whereas with the organics, we can't get the same leaf. Well, we don't want. We, do, we don't want, but we can't, I can't get enough leaf to cover the, the berries. So there's a lot more exposure. Therefore, we're far more tropical in style. Yeah. And yeah, so and from there, we evolved into... Um, you know, thoughtfully having a more open canopy. Right. And and that's kind of the, the point of what you were saying is you got in kind of right when that, that New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc boom was happening and there was demand and, and following that. And I guess your your time there kind of taught you what you wanted to create and the, and the potential and possibility, which led you to love that. Yeah. yeah. And it's all a state. Yeah, you and, you know, as we, um, as we, got to know the district better because you know, New Zealand's very young in its wine growing. Mm -hmm. It's only Sonia Blanc and Marlborough has only been planted for 30 years. So it's not a long time. So we've learned a lot more and and planting in different places and vines that are now 25, 30 years old in some cases. And um, you know, we we understand the soils a lot better. So it has been, and, and we're now in that second phase, I think, of Sauvignon Blanc evol style involvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's kind of like that, that first one, you have the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc style, <laughs> but now yeah. I feel like you're going, you, everybody's discovering, because again, it's you know, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, it's younger than me, and, and you're going to discover new, so there'll be different styles of what was once kind of yeah. grouped together, right? I I also think that Sauvignon Blanc probably need, des deserves a bit more respect that it's given, you know, by some scribes, etc., particularly in the UK. And so we're really setting out to show and explore the edges of flavors of Sauvignon Blanc, and we're really doing, we um, doing focusing on on a lot of texture with concrete eggs, amphora, more oak, mm -hmm. to see where that's going to go, and okay. it makes a tremendous difference to the wine. Well, wonderful. I think that is a great segue into tasting the wine. And um, as we do kind of 
talk us through it of, of some of the aromas and flavors and textures um, and structure that might be coming through that kind of reflect those choices that you are now making. Um, I think we presented this one uh, two or three years ago to Sauvignon Blanc Symposium here in New Zealand. And the lead, the lead panelist said, um, I don't think this wine's from New Zealand. And I said, yes, I've done my business. So I'm trying to make a style which is a little bit different from the mainstream. So we're ripening most probably more open canopy and picking later. Picking 20, 21 and a half to 22 bricks with the nice ripe tropical flavors. And also, rather than being a chemist, I'm more a microbiologist. So we're putting the half the wine goes through malolactic fermentation now with the citric negative bacteria. So we're not getting any, you're not getting a big um, diacetyl component or buttery component there, but you're still getting the, the texture and the mouthfeel from the southern yeah. island. I think. For me, the biggest difference that organic winemaking and this new philosophy, this real thoughtful viticulture, because remember our vineyards here tend to be a lot bigger mm -hmm. um, and we've got a tremendous labor issue. So it's difficult to consider each vine, but we're really trying. So is that the style is quite different. So on the nose is probably where you see it most in mm -hmm. that it doesn't leap and jump out of the glass and hurtles down your throat. So you've got to actually stable it for a little while and then it comes back and and hopefully calls you back for another look mm -hmm. but still it's tremendously aromatic but you're, you, mm. it's not um sometimes it's more this is not as pungent i guess as the uh, not that that's a bad thing but it's not as as much as that classic you know 90s yeah. and, and it has to do with the you know with the more that the pyrazines that because the canopy is a lot more open we have less of those you know, we have such an abundance of those things and styles here in New Zealand that we can afford to pull back quite a lot. Yeah. And I love this wine because I, I know it's Sauvignon Blanc. And, mm. and most of it tells me that it's New Zealand, but I feel like it's that evolving style that you were you were saying mm. that you're aiming for, of kind of really representing that sense of place. There's more complexity. There's more texture. <laughs> um, it's, it's more open in a way. Mm. Also, just a point about the 21 vintage was terrific. Okay. Um, yes, it is quite pungent because that it was very small crop, um, mm -hmm. but absolutely terrific, warm and dry. Um, Wonderful. Well, this is delicious. So one it's one of my box. favorites. It's, it's one that um, I recommend to many people and, and drink myself. Um, so what are some of your favorite meals or pairings with this, with this wine? I think you can pretty much throw it in with most things, you know, because, because it's got such a um, pronounced um, acid structure. It sits nicely under fatty food. It sits wonderfully with, um, Asian, for me, with Asian food. And um, it's probably the only one you can drink with lettuce leaves. What do you like it with? I'm um, really a little long neck little clam, clams, I think. A clam? Um, clam, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Just had those the other night. I think it'd be beautiful with clams. Yes. Mm. Would you say lettuce leaves? Does that mean salad? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but you, okay. I learned something new to say. <laughs> I mean, salad That's just makes salad. wine bitter, doesn't it? I, 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 yeah, I know. It's, it's every country I realize it's salad or. No, I just call it lettuce leaves it's because it's not, yeah, I, it's not my favorite. <laughs> well, yes. Okay. But this is something that, that could go with a good salad. So. Um, so. Well, one last question for you would be, what is your favorite thing about working together? Or what have you learned working together? Whichever might be more relevant. Well, it's not always easy, is it? No. <laughs> Especially not as, a, as our knowledge has increased. We've, we've tend to, when we first started, we were very um, separate in our ways. I mean, I was a winemaker, Erica was a salesperson, but we tend to now have joint skills which causes a few arguments amongst us yes well no well i went and retrained in viticulture so yes so um but it's good because if you don't have i, th I think what comes out of that is just everything better but it, i think for me is basically you see parts of brilliance in someone that you don't get to see if you don't work together true that is a really wonderful way to look at it i like that 
Um, well, wonderful. This is a, a beautiful wine. I also want to mention to everybody that Love Lock makes uh, a number of wines. I also love their Pinot Gris and Pinot Noir. So um, it's a wonderful um, place. And do you make a Riesling also? We do. And Pervert Stramina. And hopefully and I- launch in the U.S. quite soon, the Sulfur Free, where we use um, tea tannin. Interesting. Antioxidant. Yes. All so right. Hopefully that will come in the next installment. Oh, good. I will be looking for that. Well, thank you so much for sharing um, your story and making such um, an incredible wine. I love everything about it. So thank you. Uh, next, we are moving to Oregon and to the Willamette Valley to the Souls, um, Corby and Rollin and the Rocco Pinot Noir. So um, Corby and Rollin, um, you have had experiences that have spanned the world. I know you were drinking some bubbles that I wish I had in my glass. But that's okay. Um, you um, have, you know, spanned the world, but kind of Oregon is your, your place. So tell us a little bit about your, your history there um, coming up to the creation of Rocco, how that evolved. Hmm. It's right. a very broad question. So you're going to have to kind of think for you. Yeah. I'm going to mostly turn this over to Rowland. Um As far as developing Rocco, I think, you know, you, we could come up with a lot of esoteric reasons as to why we did it, but really it comes down to the fact that the both of us were in the wine industry and brands that we had already created. We um, are both just intensely um, motivated people. And so we would spend a lot of our time together, you know, drinking, laughing and going, hey, how about if we do this? What if we do this? How about, you know, we have a whole list of wine labels that we've never yet created. You know, that's how we spend our free time. (laughs) And we still do it, you know, 25 years later. So I think that that's kind of how we had this beautiful piece of property that Roland had previously owned. And we thought, why not put a vineyard on it? And we're both working elsewhere. And lo and behold, pretty soon we started a brand and it got big enough that I needed Roland to come work with us full time. (laughs) And um, there we were. So... Most of our best ideas come around a campfire, uh, as most folks know. Uh, well, maybe they don't know. Uh, the majority of Oregon is BL, you know, Bureau Land Management land, which is the lowest of the lowest, but you can camp anywhere. And that's what we do. And we'll sit around a campfire and we'll come up with all these really fun ideas and laugh and all that kind of stuff. And the other part was, you know, you don't, we, we, you know, most couples, you know, they each work at different places and they're successful in those places that they work in. And we just thought, you know, why don't we, you know, experience what it's like to work together. And Mm -hmm. um, man, it's, it's actually been really good. We we managed to divide and conquer. And uh, I got to say that so many times I go blend a wine and, and I always run it past my president because Orby was the president of our company. And, uh, and she'd make a comment that were like, oh, damn it, I didn't think about that. And I'd run back up and have to rejigger everything. And she was always right. She's got such an amazing palate. So it worked out um, fantastic. R- Rocco is better um, because we have her palate, uh, not because we have just my palate. Mm-hmm. Are you saying that growing up and like being a Texan didn't teach your palate like the <laughs> like, the best way to taste he, wine? He's <clears throat> totally being modest. I know he's being modest. I've seen him. More, more yeah. chili. We need more chili. <laughs> and he is the um, creative genius within yeah. our company for sure. And he does at least let me take his blends and I get to put the consumer and the marketing perspective on it because that is my role in the company and rolling and running the day-to-day business but Rollins both science background and masters in um, winemaking is what dominates our palate profile for certain well it's good to put the, the two brains together and have have a, like a strength for each that can kind of um, come together and you both came from such prestigious um, wineries beforehand. God, I can't, I still can't believe that's you, Rollin. But um, <laughs> we were both, you know, with Carvel, Peter Creek. I mean, Burby, just- Burby was the, uh, one of the earliest uh, executive directors for the International Pinot Noir Celebration. Oh, there you and go. That's Burby. one of my favorites. Maybe we'll get those Kiwis to attend the International Pinot Noir Celebration someday and we'll, we'll join you. 
Heck yeah. Sounds perfect. Um, so also real quick, because I learned today that somebody said, well, where does Rocco come from? I'm like, well, duh. So I know, but can you please <laughs> tell us um, where the name Rocco comes from? Yeah. So my name's Roland, not Roland. And um, it's kind of a Texas pronunciation for Roland. And then, and then we got Corby over here, two unusual names. And, um, you know, it, you know, naming a business is more difficult than naming your kids. And so that's how Rocco came around. So it's Rocco like a rock, even though phonetically it should be Rocco. Although I did lobby for Coro. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah, right. That's right. I think Rocco flows off the tongue a little bit better. So I, gonna, know. I, I, would, I know. I know, but I, I get yeah. it. It's hard to kind of know when when you're getting there. But yeah, you could so. be Gwen, you could be Gwemmy. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that is, um, yeah, I'm sure that would fly off the shelves. Um, so speaking of Rocco, let's taste your wine. This is the Gravel Road Pinot Noir. So kind of talk us through this wine, um, how it's representing both, you know, the, the classic Oregon Pinot, but also kind of your style and what the reason you left your other jobs and all these ideas, you're coming together to say, this is the kind of wine we want to make. So walk us yeah, through that. I've worked, it, it took me five years into um, making wine in, the, in Oregon just to get the vineyards, you know, in shape that we wanted way back in the day. And then after that, it was just a labor of, of love to try to figure out how to do these things. And these are all small uh, uh, ferments. Uh, the fruit is always chilled before we de-stem, so that makes sure that we have lots of whole berries. So lots of whole berry soaking goes on in this wine. And you know, being an old guy uh, and somewhat trustworthy old guy, uh, we get a lot of really great vineyards that step up and uh, produce fruit for us. And so this is kind of, you know, the, the best of Yamhill Carlton and Chehalem Mountain and Eola, Amity and Dundee Hills all put together. Everybody knows that the sum of parts is, you know, always better than each one separate. And so that's Gravel Road. Gravel Road's, you know, all our vineyards are, we're still rural, um, like uh, the folks down in Marlboro, uh, where we, you know, Gravel Roads do this to all of our vineyards. And so that's kind of where this comes from. Like so we'd that. like to make a Pinot that's really juicy in the center. And what I really enjoy about this wine is analytically, it's really high in phenolics, but you never taste it because it's got the you know, beautiful, rich, ripe fruit in the middle. Um, it does, but it has, a, it has such a great savory component to it in the, in the, in the aromas. And, and that's natural, like proper, cool climate Pinot Noir has spice it even has vanilla quite often um, it's a, it's pretty neat how how many components come with pinot noir it's the only red variety i know of that really kind of tastes like it came from the roots and, and came from the fruit and, mm -hmm. and from the environment it's grown in it's yeah it is here. it's a sense of place it pulls the dirt out and yeah, that's so. So it's <laughs> in the wine <laughs> The, yeah. This Pinot Noir is grown as far north as you can go on the on the U.S. coast in yeah, really yeah. ripe Pinot Noir. If you think about it, yeah. Well, I think New Zealand probably has, has similar similar vineyards where the, the further south. So, True. yes, like the the edge of the world grape is uh, yeah. <laughs> Pinot Noir. So, um, yeah, I, I love this wine. I actually took it over to my parents last night um, um, for dinner. Um, they're big Pinot fans and um, it's just a, it's a beautiful wine and it's got the structure, it's got the flavor, it kind of has everything that I think really represents um, Oregon. So Thank you. glad y'all made this venture into doing Rocco um, on your own. So food pairings, what would you, I mean, I guess, I mean, it's very versatile, just like that's something blah. It is. It's very oh, versatile. Wine. So I always feel that when you're pairing wines with food that um, they should be balanced. So if you're foods are highly acidic that you need a lot of acid in your wine. If your foods mm -hmm. are really fatty, then you need a very voluptuous wine. If you need, you know, and as you go through the, um, the flavors should balance so that one isn't, uh, you know, overbalancing the other or um, knocking the other off so one doesn't taste it. So when I drink this wine, I think of um, deal and pork chops and um, you can even go into chickens uh, and 
you know, beautiful roasted vegetables and turkey. I, this would be great with a steak, but yet, you know, because a steak can be really dark and rich, and this isn't necessarily our most, you know, voluptuous red we make. Mm -hmm. That while this might go great with some steaks that you might want uh, another wine with that, this would be great with a fatty salmon though. Um, so Make sure the salmon's got fat, that's yeah, key. Yeah. <clears throat> mushrooms, oh my goodness, oh, we, so have, good we have mushrooms up here out, you know, like crazy, all different kinds. And man, yeah. any kind of mushroom dish with this wine, it's, it's a beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah, and it's gorgeous with cheeses. Um, yeah, just beautiful with breeze and blue cheese. Goat and breeze and we have blue. blue. And blue cheese, all right. So We're first blue. of all, <laughs> first of all, wine. Well, there's you never been a time. Any, any box, so. Think we had a chicken, it. we had we'd have a chicken thighs with some herbs so and Oh yeah. There's there's never been a time in American history when Americans have enjoyed such a diversity of cuisine. And Pinot Noir, you know, rings the bell. Um, yeah. And we also have a diversity of wine now, too, I think, that oh. come in as, as well. So okay, and I think I mean you kind of mentioned this of how much you really enjoy working together which is kind of having a little bit of a, a yin and yang. Is there anything more you want to add to that? Well, um, only in that, you know, we work together and we share an office. And I think, you know, <laughs> I have staff who always says to me, gosh, you guys never fight or anything. It's really nice to work with a couple that doesn't fight. But, you know, we kind of, you know, it's nice because we keep in our own areas. We don't, I'm not a winemaker and I don't pretend to be one. And um, so Rowan lets me do my things. I run the day-to-day -day business and staff and I um, give him his room to be creative. Good. Uh, yeah. So you found your, your yin and yang. So. Yeah, the yin and yang. That's right. um, well, thank you so much for sharing the wine. Um, as I mentioned, I love this. It's great, perfect Oregon Pinot. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so next we're going to move over and talk to the Gots in California about their Zinfandel. Um, so uh, Sarah and Joel. Um, Joel, I know you have generations of, of vintner, vintners um, before you, kind of growing up in the in the vineyards, if you will. And, and Sarah, you have a degree in fermentation sciences, which is amazing, from UC Davis. And so you're wine people, and you're California wine people. Um, tell us a little bit about that path of that impetus to start um, Joel Got Wines, your own label. Yeah, you know, I mean, when we started, we were still boyfriend girlfriend um oh my God, so cool. <laughs> being like 24 or we were 25 i don't remember um and you know we were drinking a lot of zen we you know we drank everything right super experimental um of just you know really getting into the wine industry and at that age you can drink a ton of stuff and it doesn't bite you the next day as bad <laughs> and uh you know i think that was kind of the rise of turley and some other great wines you know coming out of some zins coming out of dry creek valley and the Ridge wines. And so we were just, you know, like hot to trot for Zinfandel. And uh, we had some family friends up in Amador County, a guy named Tom Dillion that had some really incredible old vines. Um, and that very first year in 1996, we bought five tons of Zinfandel. Sarah was the enologist or assistant winemaker at Joseph Phelps at that time. And I thought it was just for fun. I didn't realize this was, it wasn't like a business that we were like, let's start this. It was, yeah. let's just make wine and see what happens. And then we made wine and it kept going. <laughs> it's still going. It's still going. I, I know that's it's amazing. I, I love that because that is never anything. I would have said, I would have been like, let me try crocheting. <laughs> like, let's try making wine. Not, not, not there, but I guess, you know, when you have that, that knowledge, um, well, we're glad you did. Um, so obviously that's been very successful over the years. We are tasting your Zinfandel, even though your portfolio and your, your selection spans so many different grape varieties. And what I, one thing I love about it too, is they're very, they're just all affordable to, to the American consumer, which I think it's so great to get really high quality wine at an affordable price, um, which isn't always the case in California, but we're coming back to Zinfandel. So, um, so let's talk a little about this um, wine that we're, we're showcasing here and kind of your thoughts on Zinfandel in California and, and how your, kind of your methodology goes into that. 
Well, I think we started the first few years were all from Amador County, which as Joel said, he actually had grown up there. So we had, you know, sort of that personal tie, which was great, um, really old vines, um, but there just wasn't quite enough available fruit. So we started sourcing other directions. Um, and some of that was Sonoma, some of that was Mendocino, um, a little bit here in Napa at one point, but um, we got to the point where we wanted to keep it affordable and, and um, you know, be able to, as, as you had said, make the blend, the blend is always better than the single, single spot. So we went with the California label. So it gave us the most option um, and, I think our, our style, even though we were quoting a lot of those wines before in terms of what the wines that we love, we really wanted to keep a, a well-balanced wine. I wouldn't say, you know, we're, we're not at that 15% or plus alcohol. Um, it's really kind of keeping the acid, alcohol, fruit, tannin structure um, all into good balance. So it goes with, you know, anything you want to drink. It's a great summer wine still. It's not it you know, doesn't have to be in, in a winter with a stew. It can be um, pizza and a barbecue. Yeah. So uh, talk us through a little bit about some of the aromas and flavors, kind of the, the profile as we go through this. You know, I mean, I would say like the 19 vintage, right? It's pretty classic for Zinfandel, right? It's super like fruit forward, cooked berry, right? You get a lot of that brambly berry. And in 19, right, you know, we had a pretty moderate summer, so we didn't have any big heat spikes. We actually picked it quite late for Zin. It was in early September, so it got really ripe with that really high alcohol. Um, and then you get this kind of this amazing, you know, vanilla off of the American oak barrels that it's in. But then it's that black pepper and, you know, kind of the cedar coming from the barrels. Um, 19 was a really good vintage for Zin. Yeah, it's really pretty and it's got a smoky kind of, I love that part about Zin, that little slight smoky note, but I always get it. We're all so scared in the wine business of smoke tape. We hear the Oh, I know that's true. Yes. No, I, I live in California and not to know smoke tape, but it's not the smoke. It's more of like the throwing a pork chop in the grill kind of smoke, like yeah. something yeah. savory. Yeah. 19, yeah. we were safe. Yeah. 19, we were safe. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The other one. But 20, we didn't um, do. <laughs> yes. Um, and what about like structure of a Zinfandel? Kind of talk to me about what somebody should expect with that, like in comparison to certain other red wines. Well, it, probably the easiest way to think about it, right, is, is that Zinfandel is the softer and spicier, you know, more Rhone-like style wine, whereas, you know, when it's juicy, Cabernet, you get the tannins, the structure, you kind of get a, a, a broader mouthfeel, whereas Zinfandel is like almost more punch. You get, you know, upfront big fruit, it can be concentrated fruit, spicy finish, elongated flavors, whereas you know, uh, is compared to like Merlot, which would be softer all the way through, but big fruit load in it. So I think Zinfandel is kind of your spicy, juicy, fruit forward Rhone style, mm -hmm. you know, not like Syrah, but <clears throat> not a like standard profile. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's delicious. Yeah. It does remind me a little bit of, of Rhone, especially like the Southern Rhone, mm -hmm. um, blends that you're getting. So, well, what, what kind of food, I mean, you talked a little bit about like pizza, barbecue, um, which, yes, I think would be perfect. Um, anything else that are your favorite? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think of Zinfandel. I, being here in California, you think of tacos, right? So, like, you know, tofu tacos are a staple in our house, chicken tacos, steak tacos, right? Because it can handle spicy stuff. It can handle grilled flavors, can handle salsas. Um, and that's, that's the diversity of Zin is you can really go up. Um, uh, on it, you know, like, of course, it'd be fine with a cheese board or something like that, a charcuterie board would be great. You know, it would probably overpower the leaves for Erica. I love that <laughs> term, by the way. It's my favorite new salad term. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so I, I think on, on, you can have more st structured food with it and spicier food and it'll survive. Yeah. 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 It's it definitely, not overpower. definitely. Not ever power, yeah. And ribs, my husband makes really good ribs, so I would also have that. So perfect. Gosh, um, I wish we could taste that. We're sitting here with only a little Sauvignon Blanc because we can't get to any wine in New Zealand. We should get a few in New Zealand. Since mm -hmm. it's very early morning for you, I'm not sure how much different you really right. want to <laughs> have, but we'll make sure we get you some. Um, 
So um, the other, uh, I guess the other thing, uh, Sarah and Joel would be just kind of what are kind of your favorite things about working together at the same minor? Because it's been a while. It has been a while and it's sort of grown organically. I think Joel is the, um, I always sort of say he's the complete optimist and I'm a little bit more of the realist. So I think we balance each other out a little bit. Um, you know, he is that the ideas guy and has great ideas and is the entrepreneurship brain and kind of keeps, keeps going. Um, I'm more in the lab and in the tasting and the winemaking department. So that sometimes can <laughs> stress me out a little bit. Um, but you know, he, he backs it up. So he's definitely more on the business and the sales and the, all of that. And I get to sort of hide away from all of that and, and stick with the winemaking, which I love. And Sarah has an amazing team. Um, so Sarah's head winemaker, right? For all of our wines, right? Mm -hmm. And then Sarah has an amazing team of winemakers. And I try not to cross into that. And I think what's been great for us over all these years of working together is we really stay in our lanes, right? Um, I'm always warning Sarah, like there's side of our industry that you don't want to deal with. It's a pain, right? And then, you know, Sarah's like, just don't come in the lab and start touching too many things in here, <laughs> right. uh, you know? And as always, like, what do you think of this wine? I hope you give it the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we, okay, so yeah, I feel like I feel like with all of these conversations, I feel like we've gotten some really good marriage advice, which would be just stay in right. your lane. <laughs> a really good way to phrase it. Like, you know your thing, but, I know my thing. Let's just stay in our lane. So I think um, like all the couples on this, honestly, is is that we've all been doing the industry for so long, in that. Uh, you know, we grew up in the industry and meaning that, you know, in our twenties and to now, so it's just part of our everyday life. Mm -hmm. You know, the kids yeah. are stuck into the terminology and wine's part of every day. Um, I would say that in the early days, we drank more Zen. We drink by volume more Sauvignon Blanc than anything now. Right. And so, you know, it's just the wine business is part of every day for us. So it doesn't yeah. seem like work most of the time. Yeah. Um, oh, this is, has been wonderful. I have, I have one kind of follow up or like final roundup question that I'm going to throw to each of you and, and Joel and Sarah, since you're here, um, I'll give this to you first, but I, I think you've been working with these, these great kind of quintessential grapes of your region, whether it's, well, Zinfandel, but you also have Cabernet, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, for some time you've seen it kind of evolve. I just kind of, if you have any thoughts of what it is now and for the future, and that could have to do with like anything you're seeing with climate or, or changes you're going to have to make with the vineyard or production. Is there anything kind of you want to touch on um, just sort of a current and future? Well, I love what Erica and Kim are doing with the organic farming, right? And I think we all have got to take into account the environment, right? In any business, especially in the ag business, which we're all in. So, you know, being smart about how we're farming all these acres is grapes and what do they do and what's around them and, and what we're putting in a bottle is super important. Um, climate's changing for sure. You know, the lamb's getting warmer. We're getting warmer. I don't know what's happening in New Zealand. I should know that. The rain. <laughs> so, you know, more rain and we need more rain. You send some our way. Um, and so, you know, for us, uh, I would say just as a business, we've got to be smart about the environment and do everything we can to continue to improve what we do. You know, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can still do better at um, every ounce of it from the packaging to the wine. Yeah. Uh, you know, fires here in California are a real threat. Um, so, you know, we only made 30% of our wine in uh, 2020 because, you know, we had too many wildfires. There's too much smoke in the air. So, you know, maybe that's a thing. Maybe that was a one off or maybe we're going to see that more years. So, you know, just being smarter about the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kim and Erica, what about what about you guys? I mean, you know, thoughts about that? What Joel's saying, you know, I think that um, for us, obviously, rain, untimely rain events is a problem, and um, and and diurnal fluctuation that's contracting. So it changes, you know, the way we manage the canopy, it's more disease prone. So we have to be more smart about how we actually manage not only the soil and the organics, but also the um, the canopy and where we plant. For instance, we've just planted Kim's little um, plaything in Central um, about a acre of Syrah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So obviously that's quite cooler. We anticipate that we're going to have to plant further and further south. 
yeah. and that the wine style will change a little as a result. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Um, Corby, Rollin, um, what are some of the, how, how you're kind of seeing the evolve in the future and, and current now? Um, Kim, I bet uh, Larry McKenna was, you know, really excited to hear that you're going to do uh, some Syrah. But uh, here we're kind of, you know, like Erica is saying, we're a young uh, region, really. Uh, we're a little old, older than 30 years. And I think the biggest thing is, I mean, we already understand how to move with nature because I, we've, in my whatever, 35, 30, whatever years here, we've not had two vintages that are the same because we're so far in the northern extreme here. Uh, so we, we've learned to move with Mother Nature uh, already. But what's exciting for us is watching the next generation come along. And we're pretty excited about the amount of investment from long-term, you know, multi-generational European folks moving up here in the Willamette Valley. And kind of, that's kind of the way it rolls up here is it's a long-term investment and it's a long-term commitment. Uh, make, make, we make the best of kind of wines if that happens. So it's, it's exciting here. Everything's on the hillside slopes uh, already, no valley floor. Um, and, and we're, we're getting the most consistent Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays uh, in history here in the Wyatt Valley. So it's, it's great, a gold, yes. great golden age for us, frankly. Good. Well, then we, yeah, we want to see these, these vineyards kind of thrive and evolve and last for um, decades to come. So, um, so that everyone's paying attention to that and doing it. So I want to thank you all. Um, for those of you um, watching, if you don't have these wines, again, this, this tree of wines, they're so delicious, um, are available on wine.com. You can also buy them individually. As I mentioned before, um, each of these uh, wineries and, and couples running the wineries make a large selection of wines or a, a more broad selection of wines than, than what we're just tasting. So definitely worth exploring. Um, thank you again to these our dynamic duos um, that have been here, Kim and Erica, Rollin and Corby and Joel and Sarah. Really appreciate your time and, and your dedication to making these incredible wines and for joining us today. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for having us. Thank Cheers. Thank you. It's both a science and a form of high art. It's made from the combination of grapes, sunlight, rain, soil, and time. It's raised up in the moments that matter. It's wine. And we are wine.com. We have the largest wine selection in the world, online sommeliers with free advice, and now our powerful new app puts the entire world of wine in your hands. Wine.com. Seriously passionate about wine. Download our free app today.